Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Cost-Effective DNA Methylation Analysis by Multiplexed Reduced Representation Bisulfite Sequencing, presented by Paul Detlinger. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Diagenote. Diagenote is a leading global provider of complete solutions for epigenetics research, biological sample preparation, and diagnostic assays based in Liege, Belgium, and Denville, New Jersey. The company has developed new insights into epigenetic studies and offers the innovative BioRuptor shearing and IP star automation instruments, reagent kits, and high quality antibodies to streamline DNA methylation, chip, and chip seq workflows. The company's latest innovations include a full automation system, the industry's most validated antibodies, and the mega ruptor shearing system for long fragmented generation in sequencing and services for RRBS and ChIP-seq. From Diagenode's founding in 2003 in Liege, the company has expanded rapidly. Diagenode opened its U.S. branch in 2006 and developed a global distribution and partnering network. The company plans to extensively develop its range of innovative products in both epigenetics and infectious diseases markets. To learn more about Diagenode, please visit www.diagenode.com. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click during the presentation on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. If you need to enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation properly, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button lower left to let us know that you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce you to Paul Datlinger. Paul Datlinger is a PhD student in the lab of Christoph Bach at the Center for Molecular Medicine of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna and developer of a high throughput RRBS protocol available as a kit from Diagenote. He studied molecular biology at the University of Vienna, Manchester and at Imperial College London. Besides developing new technologies for next generation sequencing, his research interests revolve around epigenetic modifier networks and epigenome editing by exploiting the CRISPR-Cas9 system. I'll now turn the presentation over to Paul. Thank you, Brenda, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank the audience for your interest in my talk today about DNA methylation analysis. I'm broadcasting this live from our lab in Vienna, Austria, at uh, the Center for Molecular Medicine. I'm at the moment working as a PhD student in Christoph Box lab. And therefore, we have a huge interest in DNA methylation analysis. So the topic of today's talk will be a protocol I developed to do it in a highly multiplexed fashion but for those of you interested in the bioinformatics analysis of RBS data, I'll also have a few slides at the end um, to show you that there's actually a variety of existing tools you can use to take care of the analysis. In the Christoph Bock lab, we are very much interested in epigenetic gene regulation. And you all know that the over 200 different cell types in the human body, they are basically utilizing the same DNA sequence. But epigenetic mechanisms allow uh, and act on top of this DNA sequence and they allow um, all the different phenotypes that you can see in the human body. So in epigenomics research, we often use the term the epigenetic landscape to define a cellular state or to define a certain developmental stage that the cell is in. And we see the epigenetic landscape as a sum of all the epigenetic modifications that can work inside the cell. But in fact, it's important to note that the epigenetic landscape is something that we never have direct access to. So we cannot just do an experiment to measure the entire epigenetic landscape. But what we do instead is we select epigenetic modifications that we think 
can give us the most information about the cell's epigenetic state. And we imagine the epigenetic landscape to be organized in layers of different kinds of information, such as, for instance, histone modifications. You know that the DNA is not existing naked inside the nucleus, but it's actually wrapped around nucleosomes to form chromatin. And this generates areas that are more tightly packed and areas that are more open and accessible. And um, yeah, the nucleosomes have uh, histone tails that can be modified by histone modifications, for instance. And this is a very important layer of epigenetic gene regulation. But also there is assays that we can do to just profile how open chromatin is, uh, such as ataxic. But the layer of information we have been most interested in, and that will be the topic of today's talk, is DNA methylation. So why are we interested in DNA methylation in the first place? DNA methylation um, is a very stable epigenetic marker. Luckily for us, it exists on genomic DNA. So in this picture here, you can see uh, double-stranded genomic DNA and DNA methylation as a small methyl group on cytosine basis directly on genomic DNA. And this has a huge advantage compared to histone modifications or um, other epigenetic modifications because genomic DNA and also the methylation information is very stable. And this is um, allowing us to profile DNA methylation in samples that are very rare or very precious, such as clinical sample collections or formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples, or even environmental samples that often maybe do not have the highest quality. So this is one advantage. But uh, what's also interesting about DNA methylation is that this, it is the only truly methodically heritable epigenetic mark for which a mechanism for its propagation during cell division has been described. It is also gene regulating and has been shown to be disease relevant. For instance, up to date, there hasn't been a single cancer that was sequenced which would display completely normal DNA methylation uh, patterns. So, and also in neurological disorders, DNA methylation and DNA methylation modifiers seem to play a crucial role. We can also measure it very accurately using a chemical conversion protocol, um, which is existing since decades. It is called bisulfite conversion. And I'll talk about this a bit later during my talk. First of all, let's look in a bit more detail what DNA methylation is. So I already said it exists on genomic DNA. And uh, in fact, it is cytosine bases that become methylated. You see that at carbon position number five, uh, there is a methyl group added to form 5-methylcytosine. And this action is catalyzed by enzymes, which we call DNA methyltransferases. And in humans, there's two different types of these enzymes. First of all, there is enzymes that catalyze de novo methylation. This is required to set up new methylation patterns during development and embryogenesis. So, and those enzymes are called DNMT3A and 3B. On the other hand, there's a second process called maintenance methylation, which is catalyzed by DNMT1. And it basically happens during cell division when DNA methylation patterns in the parental strand are propagated to the daughter cell. But DNA methylation is also highly clinically relevant. And I just wanted to select two examples from my own research. The first example, which you see depicted on the left, is a project that uh, my boss, Christoph Bock, uh, did a few years ago, together with collaborators in uh, Manuel Stella's group in Barcelona. And essentially, they were dealing with cancers of unknown primary origin. Those are rare cases of cancer where a metastasis is found somewhere in the body, but it's not entirely clear where it came from, so what the origin of the tumor was. And you can imagine that such tumors are very hard to treat because we do not even know which cell type we are dealing with. So Christoph and his team, they used DNA methylation patterns that they profiled in the metastasis that was found and could use this algorithm to predict accurately what cell type the tumor came from. And this is nowadays used in clinical trials to inform the treatment of patients. So DNA methylation has a huge diagnostic value. The second example, which you see on the right, is from my own work. Um, very early on when I joined the uh, Christoph Bock lab, 
I was working on B cell leukemia and I was interested in differences between diagnosis and relapse. I was interested was there epigenetic mechanisms of drug resistance that we could find uh, on the basis of DNA methylation. And in fact, I um, was able to identify gene sets that were differentially methylated between those two time, time points, diagnosis and relapse. And um, we were able to relate this to the drugs that were actually being used for treating those patients. So both in diagnostic, uh, diagnostics, but also uh, following the treatment of a patient, DNA methylation is a very good marker. And luckily for us and for anyone interested in DNA methylation, there is a wide variety of methods we can use to do so. Some of them have a higher genomic coverage, are usually more expensive. Others um, have a higher throughput or very cheap. So we generally distinguish um, mapping technologies and discovery technologies from uh, validation technologies or even technologies we use to, to look at biomarkers in patients. And I think we have the opportunity to do a poll uh, for the audience. So I would like to take this opportunity to ask you which technologies you have been using or are planning to use in your lab. Is it the Infinium array by Illumina or um, is it already bisulfide based methods like RBS or whole genome bisulfide sequencing? restriction enzyme based methods or affinity enrichment based or are you completely new to DNA methylation analysis and just um, interested in learning more about it. Okay, I think we are slowly getting in the results of the poll. Okay, I think we can now push them out, right? Okay, thanks a lot for voting to everyone. Okay, so um, the results are actually a bit surprising to me, I have to say, because I was expecting more people to uh, use the Infinium um, assay, which is a microarray based technology by Lumina. Um, and I'm also happy that a lot of people are new to DNA methylation analysis. So, um, and some of you are even using RBS already. Um, thanks a lot for voting. I hope that I will be able to convince you that RBS is actually worthwhile setting up in your lab and using for large scale projects. Okay, so back to the slide. Um, this is an image that I took from a review that dates back to 2010 by Peter Lear. And back then the situation was quite different. Bisophite-based technologies like RBS or whole genome bisophite sequencing, they are considered the gold standard because they give you single base resolution of DNA methylation. But on the other hand, at least in 2010, the sequencing costs associated with them were so high that this was severely limiting the throughput. So um, people back then were mostly using the Infinium uh, macroarray platform as a very cost-effective means to do large-scale methylation studies. And what I would, would hope uh, to convince you today is that in recent years, on the one hand, sequencing costs were dropping, but on the other hand, we also managed to um, increase the throughput of RBS quite substantially to make it an attractive method also for large-scale studies. But in order to study DNA methylation, we first need to know where we can find it in the genome. And this is very interesting. So I'm depicting genomic DNA here and DNA methylation, at least in somatic cells, is happening exclusively at CPG dinucleotides. So a CPG dinucleotide is a C that is immediately followed by a G in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And only some stem cells show or, yeah, I mean there, there, there is some exceptions to this rule, but I would say in somatic cells usually 99% of methylation events happen at CPG dinucleotides. And you see that I depict some of them methylated and others are unmethylated. Those CPG dinucleotides, they are not distributed randomly throughout the genome, but they are biased in regions that we call CPG islands. The reason for that is 
that a methylated cytosine has a certain propensity to mutate to form a T. And this is actually the most common form of mutations in humans and is considered a signature of aging. So evolution has made sure that CPG dinucleotides are kept in regions that are non-coding but are regulatory, where they can exert their epigenetic function. And to show you how biased the distribution is, I would like to introduce very quickly a measurement of CPG density. Basically, we are just looking at the CPG. We are calculating the distances to the neighboring CPGs and we're taking the minimum. And when we plot this, you can see this is not a random distribution. This is very biased towards short distances, meaning most of the CPGs, which are the sites of DNA methylation, are very close together. And if you think about next generation sequencing, which many people also know as shotgun sequencing, where we break the whole genome into pieces and by sequencing very short pieces and connecting them back by alignment software to find the original position in the genome where they came from, um, you, you can see this is just not a very efficient way of mapping DNA methylation because the CPGs are not distributed randomly. And as sequencing costs drop, maybe in, in 10 years, five years from now, we might all do whole genome bicepad sequencing. And it's a great technology, certainly the gold standard. But at the moment, it is just really a little bit too expensive. It's probably about 10 times more expensive than the method I'm introducing today, reduced representation bicepad sequencing. In reduced representation bicepad sequencing, we use an enzymatic enrichment step and restriction enzyme that cuts mostly in regions of high CPG density and the fragments we get can be size selected and by size selecting for the very small fragments this allows us to narrow down the sequencing to regions of a high CPG density especially CPG islands and we can get away with, with just sequencing 5% of the genome in humans for instance but we get 80% of information from CPG islands which regulate um, gene expression. So I think that's um, yeah, quite, quite an efficient enrichment for those regions. And I'd like to go into even more detail because I really want you to understand how the method works. And that's actually not so complicated at all. So we start with genomic DNA. And we cut with a restriction enzyme called MSP1. MSP1 has the following motif, uh, CCGG. And what's very important to notice when we cut with MSP1, like I'm showing now, we do not use this enzyme to enrich for the methylated or unmethylated state. But what we do is just we cut open the DNA at sites of DNA methylation, no matter whether they are unmethylated or methylated. And we are just making sure that the beginning and the end of each of the fragments will start with the information that we want, which is a CPG dinucleotide. And I'm just focusing on one fragment now to explain the process of library preparation. In order to make this compatible with Illumina sequencing, we have to introduce some common sequence to it. For instance, for next generation sequencing, we need a sequencing primer that will bind to each of the fragments and read the sequence. But now we just have a random fragment. So we need to ligate sequencing adapters to the fragments. And we start out by repairing the ends. This is done by just a fill-in reaction with an enzyme because we have a five prime overhang and we can fill it in. in. At the same time, we can provide excess ATP and we can use a mistake that the polymerase makes, um, which we call A-tailing. So by providing the polymerase with excess ATP, we can make sure that an additional A-nucleotide is added to each fragment. And uh, later this allows us to ligate an adapter containing all the sequences required for NGS, which has the complementary T overhang. And this adapter can also have a barcode so that we can tell samples apart, even if we mix them. So in theory, this fragment would be ready for Illumina sequencing, but we haven't um, dealt with the methylation information yet. In order to turn the methylation information into something we can detect by sequencing, we need to do a chemical conversion reaction, which is called bisophite conversion. 
And it's a very old chemical reaction that will convert by a three-step process cytosin to uracil. But at the same time, it leaves, uh, it leaves methylated cytosines unaffected. So actually what we're doing here is we're turning an epigenetic difference into a genetic difference. And then we can just read it with normal sequencing. So the last step of the protocol is a PCR enrichment. This helps us on the one hand to amplify our material, but also resolves um, the FOX structure that is required for the adapters because we need to be strand specific. And in the end, uh, a cytosine will first be a uracil, but then during PCR, the um, strands, the complementary strand will have an A that pairs with uracil, and then this will turn the original cytosine into a T. So we're looking at C to T conversions here whenever a cytosine was unmethylated. But when the cytosine is methylated, it remains a C. And at the time when I started using this method, there was already publications out there describing how to do it. Actually, very detailed descriptions as well. Um, but in the end, uh, this was our final outcome. And we were not very happy with it. So when we do next generation sequencing, before we commit a library to sequence, um, and before we decide that actually we want to spend the money to get the sequences for this library, we usually load it on um, yeah, a microfluidics device that uh, can give us the precise distribution of a library. And at the same time, we were also simulating the size distribution of an MSV1 digested human genome on the computer. And MSV1 has this, uh, it, it, it um, sometimes forms satellite bands. We, we think that's because of repetitive elements in the genome, which are cut by MSV1 and then form a lot of fragments with exactly the same size. And for, human, for the human genome, there were three satellite bands predicted. But in our library, we are only finding two, and we found those are the larger two, and we're actually missing out on a lot of small fragments, and those fragments have the highest CPG density. We also saw actually we're not getting very big fragments either. And we decided to do two uh, optimizations, which I think helped make this protocol a success. First of all, um, we wanted to keep even the smallest fragments. And we found uh, that we could actually leave out a lot of the cleanup steps. Uh, but then in RBS, what's very critical is a step that is called size selection. Depending on your project, depending on your research question, you want to select a very specific range of fragments that gives you a certain genomic feature, for instance, or if you want to focus on CPG islands only, you are happy with the smallest fragments. If you want to extend into more dynamic regions like enhancers, you probably need bigger fragments. So depending on the research question, um, we can uh, adjust the size distribution of the library. And for this, we use magnetic beads that can bind DNA and the bind DNA in the presence of a crowding reagent, which contains high salt and polyethylene glycol. And depending on the ratio of crowding reagent to sample, we can very accurately select for specific sizes. And this is probably one of the most requested slides that I made. A lot of people ask me for this slide because it, it shows how you can control the size of your library using different bead ratios uh, and doing different kinds of spray cleanups. The second improvement we made to the protocol concerns bisulfite conversion, the actual chemical conversion step converting cytosine to uracil. We found that this is actually a very, very destructive process. For instance, what I'm showing you here um, is a quantification of our library when we make libraries we can do qPCRs with a primer that will bind the sequencing adapter. And this qPCR tells us how much of the library we have in our queue. I mean, we can do this before we do the bisulfite conversion and afterwards as well. And comparing the cycle numbers, we found that um, the difference was more than 10 cycles. Imagine in each cycle you double your amount of material. So this is a huge uh, material loss. And here we were actually using one of the standard kits standard protocols from one of the big manufacturers. Um, in the end, we found that thermal cycling, for instance, was one of the key um, improvements we did. We found that we, by cycling between temperatures, we were actually able to convert much more efficiently. This allowed us to get away 
with lower concentrations of reagent and in fact below its temperatures and so on. We didn't leave almost any of the parameters uh, unchanged. So, um, And in the end, the difference in qPCR cycles for uh, our protocol today is just five. Um, and you'll see the effect of this in this comparison. On top, we did the original protocol that was published. At the bottom, you see our improved version of the protocol with the two new improvements. First of all, um, no cleanups during library preparation, a better size selection to give us very small fragments. You see now, for instance, we have all three satellite bands there. But we also improved the bicepipe conversion. We made it much less aggressive, but still um, uh, wanted it to, to convert very efficiently. And you see very big fragments as well. Big fragments in RBS are not a problem because I showed you earlier MSP1 fragments always start immediately with the methylation information. So we don't really need to read a lot, we just need to read the end. And therefore, big fragments, they're just read like any other small fragment, but they give us information from outside of CPG islands. And the improvements to the protocol are also reflected in the data quality that we get. The original RBS protocol, as far as I remember, was described with 1.5 million CPG dinucleotides. You, uh, for the human uh, samples, the human genome has 27 million CPG dinucleotides. And in fact, our new protocol gives you 4 million CPGs routinely, if the quality of your sample is all right. Um, so if you're familiar with those uh, genomic features, um, I think it's also quite interesting to look where do we get the CPG coverage. And of course, um, as expected, most of our coverage is in CPG islands and in promoter regions, but surprisingly, we also get very good coverage in, for instance, uh, exonic regions, in histone 3 K27 acetylated regions, which are active enhancers and active regulatory elements of the genome. We get coverage in transcription factor binding sites, and this is looking exactly at the transcription factor binding site. We get coverage in DNA's hypersensitive regions, which are open regions of chromatin with a regulatory role. So actually also for the proposed dynamic functions of DNA methylation, like regulating enhancers, regulating splicing, regulating or keeping a record of transcription factor binding, we actually see coverage for those regions with our protocol. But one crucial point for us was to have a protocol that could work also on large-scale projects. For instance, we were very interested in um, doing projects on patient material, such as formalin-fixed paraffin embedded samples, which would, um, yeah, where we would do hundreds of patients at the same time. So it was important to us to have a very high throughput. And I think the protocol can really be classified into two stages. The first stage is fast, it is where you make the library. But the second stage is very work intensive, where you have to do bisified conversions, um, where you do enrichment PCRs and you amplify your library, where you do the final QC and cleanups. This is a work intensive stage. So um, we introduce a pooling step in between. I already told you that the library adapters we are using have indices on them and this allows us to pool samples together um, before the work intensive steps. And we are doing this based on qPCR data. So after the library preparation, which we just do in the 96 well plate without cleanups, um, we do a quick size selection and we then do a qPCR and pool samples together based on how they perform throughout the protocol, which the qPCR tells us. And of course, they have to have uh, adapters that can be combined. But then all of the other steps uh, can be done with minimal effort in tubes. And this is actually um, yeah, the timing of the protocol. For a technician, it takes five days, but this is, um, I think, a very feasible timing that I'm giving here. Day one is just sample normalization and digestion, for instance. So it gives you really enough time for each of the steps to do it properly. I think even if you were doing it for the first time, you could manage to complete it within five days. And the picture on the right here showing the fine libraries and the size distribution is intended to show you how reproducible the libraries are. 
they are all of the same size and um, look um, yeah, like very high quality libraries. And I'd really like to thank our excellent technicians, Amelie Kuchler and Johanna Hadler, who have run uh, the RBS protocol on so many samples. So um, actually they did over 3000 samples from nine countries and I think it was probably a bit over 20 projects that they were tackling at the same time. And this of course gave us the opportunity to do it on very different kinds of samples, different qualities, different species, uh, and in general just different experimental designs that require different coverage, different sizes of libraries to be selected. And at a certain point we just realized that we cannot keep up with uh, the demand anymore, like people are asking us for projects, but we do not have enough time to take on all of those projects. And this is when we decided to team up with Dayashinov. And I really want to thank Antje Moss, who has helped us develop the protocol into a real product. And basically it is now for sale on the Daesh Node website as a kit. I think um, since I showed you the quality of data we can get and the throughput we can achieve, um, the situation is now very different from 2010, the first slide I showed you. I think in 2016, RBS has really, yeah, has been catching up a lot with microarray based methods such as the Infinium assay. And I want to do a fair comparison here, comparing the current implementation of the Infinium chip, which covers 850,000 um, CPG dinucleotides, and I'd like to compare it to our protocol, which covers 4 million CPG dinucleotides. So you already see you get five times more CPG dinucleotides from the RBS protocol. Um, and at the same time, what we always liked about reduced representation by sequencing is that there is no prior knowledge involved. So we get an unbiased representation of the CPG dinucleotides uh, and it's not selected in any way by prior knowledge. I think this is very important to look at regions that are not very well studied so that you can find new mechanisms uh, and get new, new ideas. And I think it's especially interesting with uh, the recent discoveries in the field of DNA demethylation where there's very little known about the mechanisms of demethylation, maybe hydroxymethylcytosine, formal carboxycytosine. If this is interesting to you, it would be compatible with reduced presentation by sequencing as well. Uh, and I think then it's really worth looking into, into the new regions. But like any um, microarray based method, the Infinium assay is suffering from batch effects as well. And as a next generation sequencing based and bisulfide conversion based method, RBS is just more robust. I've been teaching it now to six people um, at least and the results were always very comparable and robust. Also, we can get away with uh, 25 times less material. If your sample is really good, you can make a successful library with just 10 nanograms. And this has been very important to our clinical collaborators who of course have collected samples over decades and they want to waste as little of the material on, on the methylation run as possible to keep it for the future. This uh, has also allowed us to do formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples, FFP samples, which is the standard for biobanking. So often those collections of FFP samples date back, date back over decades. And with the Infinium array, uh, usually um, you need a restore kit to make it work, but with RBS we can do it without modification to the protocol. Another drawback of Infinium is it's human only, so there's um, no mouse version of it if you're working in any other organism. And I think this is the biggest limitation. Otherwise for human, because it came out in 2016, the selection of CPGs is probably quite solid and according to the newer knowledge. But who knows when it will be updated the next time. And the cost per sample, there, this is certainly an advantage of Infinium that is still slightly cheaper than RBS, but I think RBS can, can offer more detail um, if uh, you're willing to pay a bit more for it. Um, actually, maybe if you're a clinician and you're not planning to do library preps on your own, not planning to do the pre-processing of the data, I'd also like to mention that just like for Infinium, there is um, solutions for RBS where you can get either a kit or there's also a service. Let's maybe look a little bit into this. Um, this is the Diagenode website um, where they are selling the kit 
in both the 24 reaction and the 96 reaction format, you can, you can get this kit if um, you want to do libraries very fast. As I said, it takes five days. But you can also get the analysis as a service. So if you don't want to do the analysis yourself, you can get all kinds of reports and very interesting plots, the differential methylation analysis directly as a service. But I also want to, um, yeah, put in, I, I wanted to put in some slides for the bioinformaticians amongst you. Um, because I think that the analysis part is probably what scares people away from using next generation sequencing based methods like RBS. And I want to show you that there's actually a wide variety of existing tools you could use and that it's really not so tricky after all. But since I'm not, um, I don't know how much you know about uh, the technology behind the luminous sequencing, so what kind of data we're actually producing, I'd like to very quickly go over the process of Illumina sequencing so that we have an idea of what the data, how it is generated and what it looks like. And this is really just one slide. So an Illumina sequencer is uh, using a technology called sequencing by synthesis. And this is happening on the flow cell. The flow cell is essentially just a fancy glass slide with oligonucleotides that are spotted onto the glass slide. And those oligonucleotides can serve as uh, primers during a PCR amplification. So essentially when we load a library onto a flow cell, we dilute the library a lot so that actually there is the molecules are single molecules on this gas slide. And then we utilize the oligos on the flow cell to undergo a process called cluster amplification, which is required to amplify the signal that we detect in the end. And cluster amplification will make thousands of molecules out of this one molecule that ended up at a certain spot, but all of the sequences are identical to the original molecule. Then our sequencing primer can bind to a cluster and it is extended cycle by cycle by blocked fluorescent molecules. And only um, when we want to initiate the next sequencing cycle, we deblock the nucleotides there and we can couple the next one. And essentially, uh, the machine is taking pictures of the flow cell during this process, cycle after cycle, and you can see the clusters here as um, yeah, bright dots that fluoresce at a certain um, yeah, wavelength, depending on which base was incorporated in this cycle. And if you go through the images, and this is done by the software automatically, it does base calls, and it gives you the sequence for each of the clusters. So, and there's a read coming out of each of the clusters. If we summarize the results, the intensities for all the bases we get over all cycles for an RBS library, you can uh, see the pattern on the right. First of all, the library starts with the restriction site for MSP1, which is a TGG or a CGG, uh, depending on whether the C was methylated or not. And then you can see an overall depletion of Cs because of bisulfite conversion. Many Cs are not methylated, many are not in the CPG context, so it usually this completely drops down but we have more T's instead because we convert them to T's. This is what an RBS library looks like. And then the data pre-processing really just requires three steps. And this is actually data, so the, the sequences you can see here is actually data that are just copied out of the BAM file and you get this BAM file from the sequencing facility. So up to here, you don't even have to worry about the process. I just wanted to yeah, tell you uh, the background behind it. But from those sequences, actually, we have to do three steps. First of all, it, with our libraries, because we have very short fragments, some of them, some of the fragments of all the inserts are smaller than 50 bases. And we are sequencing 50 bases into the fragment. So this means that we will actually sequence through the fragment in some cases and already sequence the sequencing adapter that's on the other side. And this is what I'm highlighting in blue here. So we need a process called adapter trimming and we also use this to do quality trimming. Low quality bases are not very useful to us and we trim them away as well. And there's existing tools to do the job, which are pretty much similar to um, adapter trimming uh, in any other NGS based application. The second step is a bit more special. Uh, it is the alignment step where we want to find the position of the reads within the reference genome. And we use special aligners because we are dealing with bisulfite converted reads. 
and the basified con uh, converted reads have mismatches, of course. If we convert a C to a T, it will be a mismatch to the reference, and we need aligners that can deal with this. In fact, uh, the alignment looks like this. You can see the reads, they are all stacking up on top of each other because they start at the restriction side, and we sequence for exactly 50 base pairs. This is why they um, basically yeah, are on top of each other. And the third step, finally, is methylation calling, where a script goes really into the details. It dives into the reads. I'm just showing this here as an image. On the right side, you'll see uh, sequencing reads that were mapped to the genome, and you see that some bases are highlighted. For instance, in the top sample, this is, this is two samples, in the top sample there is mainly Ts. And this means that there was only unmethylated cytosines, which were converted by the bicyclic conversion into Ts. The bottom sample, however, has methylated cytosines as well. You can see that six of the positions are protected from conversion and they still show up as a C. So really, um, Bicephate conversion and RBS gives us base resolution. We can really tell exactly what, at what base the methylation event happened. And we can uh, also do very, very accurate measurements if we have enough reads, because this is basically a, yeah, a digital readout. It's either methylated or not. So we also get absolute values. And the methylation calling will, in the end, yield a table that gives you a CPG dinucleotide, its chromosome, its position on the chromosome, and its methylation value. If you want to learn more about uh, existing tools for DNA methylation, I can recommend this review that was written by my boss, Christoph Bock, back in 2012, but it's still quite up to date, I have to say. Or to cut it short, I'm giving you also a list of our favorite tools for the various steps. For instance, for step one, for the retrieving, we like to use Trinomatic or Trinolore, they are great tools. For step two, the alignment, we uh, really like to use PSMAP. Uh, Bismarck is also a great aligner. They are both specifically made for bisulfide converted data. And the last step is methylation calling. There, most people have custom scripts. You can get ours from GitHub because it was published along with uh, Johanna Klukhammer's paper on reference free DNA methylations. If you go to this GitHub page, you can find the script called basic Math Calling that can do the job. But there's also existing tools and, and very convenient tools that go beyond just the pre-processing of data. One tool I'd still like to highlight is called Iron Beats. It was developed by PhD students of Christoph Bock, my, my boss, and, but he's also a group leader at uh, the Max Planck Institute for Informatics. And this package is called Iron Beats. It's based on the statistical programming language R and is organized in a modular fashion. So different modules can do the data import, the quality control, pre-processing, or also very interesting plots for you. They can do differential methylation, whatever you like. It makes it very easy to analyze simple experimental designs like uh, treatment, uh, treated, untreated, or different groups of patients. And it makes very pretty plots that can be used in a publication immediately. There is one last topic I wanted to touch on. I think it's uh, just three more slides because there's also a lot of people interested in doing evolutionary studies. They want to study the evolution of the epigenome and epigenetic mechanisms. And DNA methylation is a very accessible mark and therefore the top choice to do so. And in fact, we have a project that was mainly headed by Johanna Kuhlkammer with the help of Amelie Kugler in the lab. And they have done RBS libraries using our protocol on many, many different animals. And I'm showing just a few examples. You can see it's very a diverse selection of species. And also the DNA quality was quite mixed because some of the animals, they were just found like uh, after weeks in the wild. Uh, but the protocol can still deal with uh, those samples and generate very good RBS libraries. You can see the species specific satellite bands that ms one generates. They're always different for any species you're working on. And they are usually a good criterion for the quality of your library. If you have a good quality library, you will see very pronounced satellite bands. And you can also simulate this on the computer to make sure that it's uh, the expected pattern. Um, but as you might have realized, some of those species, they do not even have a sequence genome. And this is a problem that Johanna solved as well uh, by a clever approach she called Red3DMA. This is an algorithm she recently published in Cell Reports in 2015. 
Um, and it does reference-free differential methylation analysis. So if you're working in an organism without the sequenced genome, you can still use RBS and you can still do methylation analysis. The way it works is basically it is based on the fact that the reads for RBS, they start at the same position, they pile up, they start at the restriction site of MSB1. And therefore, uh, we can cluster reads based on their sequence similarity, even though we don't really know where they come from in the genome. And this is what Johanna does in the first step. She clusters by read similarity, and from each cluster of reads, she deduces a consensus sequence and thereby C's and T's, so positions where you have both C's and T's, they are treated as equivalent and they are uh, written into the consensus as a C. Then, in the next step, she builds, instead of a reference genome, she builds a deduced reference genome, which then can be used just like any reference genome would be used to align reads, to get methylation calls from it, and from those methylation calls, we can then do either Sequence motive-based analysis is methylation increasing in a certain transcription factor binding site, for instance. Or we can cross-reference those regions where we see differential methylation with very well annotated genomes like human, zebrafish, mouse, and so on. Good. Uh, I think I'm right on time. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I would still like to thank a lot of people because um, with a project at this scale, it just wouldn't have been feasible without their help. First of all, um, from our lab, the Christoph Bock lab in Vienna, I would like to thank Johanna Klukhammer, who has done um, most of the interesting downstream analysis for the RBS data and has come up with this interesting referee DMA algorithm. I would like to thank Amelie Kuchler and Johanna Hadler, two great technicians who have, who have done the RBS on, on over 3,000 samples very successfully. I'd like to thank Matthias Fallig, who has helped me in developing the method especially with the bisulfide conversion. And my thanks also go out to the Bayern uh, Medical Sequencing Facility that we have at SAM, um, Thomas Benz, Donald Halper, Michael Schuster, Heiko Müller, who have a lot of expertise now with sequencing RBS libraries. So if you might do RBS uh, libraries yourself and you're still looking for a sequencing facility which you can send it to, probably the Bayern Medical Sequencing Facility would be a good choice as well. Also, thanks to um, the bioinformaticians at the Max Planck Institute for developing r &Bs. and last but not least to the team at Diagenol who helped us develop, it, develop this into an actual product and have a kit out there and also a service to yeah, help people basically start using RBS. So thank you very much for your attention and I would be ready to, to answer some questions if you have questions. You're right, Paul, we do have a lot of questions. I just want to remind our audience they can submit their questions, which they're doing a great job of, by clicking on the green Q&A button, typing the question into the box. We'll get right to your questions. We have uh, an attendee who asks, Paul, how would you expect this methodology to be different when dealing with non-model organisms with no reference genomes? Um, so, Talking about, talking about the, the wet lab protocol, this is not different at all. We do exactly the same steps, exactly the same protocol, only the analysis is different. And there I can yeah, really recommend to read Johanna Klukhammer's paper in Cell Reports, which uh, contains a detailed description of the algorithm she's using. And there's a GitHub site uh, with the project where you can get all of the code uh, she tested it also that uh, it works if you download it, it will work on your machine. And she's also a very helpful person, so of course feel free to contact her about, about this. But uh, in terms of the wetlock protocol, this would be the same. Maybe you would probably, depending on the size of the genome of the organism you're looking at, you would maybe combine more than six samples. If you have a small genome, you can get away and you can do much cheaper sequencing as well. So genome size is... Um, yeah, can, can also help you make it even cheaper. I hope this answers the question. 
Okay, on to the next, a uh, little bit of a continuation. Is the modified protocol available to the public? Um, yes, I would think so. Um, but um, yeah, if, if you want to get it set up as easy and quickly as possible, I would still recommend the kit probably because it just takes some time to get, get the hang of it. Um, but yeah, um, contact us anytime also about the modified protocol. Thank you. Our next question, can you give us more details about which samples are possible to analyze? Frozen samples, FFEP samples, do they need any special treatment? Okay, so in fact, we can do both fresh frozen and FFP samples with the same protocol, so we do not modify the protocol. When we do so, um, there's a few things to keep in mind. It is a restriction-based assay, and the most important step is cutting the genomic DNA with MSP1. So one limitation is your genome cannot be fragmented already. So there's a certain size limit. Usually we say that fragments have to be 2,000 bases or longer uh, for a successful library preparation. And for most FFP samples, this is also the case. Uh, of course, um, what will happen right, if your fragments are already, uh, are already uh, randomly fragmented, then um, this, those fragments will also be suitable to go into the library preparation and you will have in the end a mix of whole genome sequencing and reduced representation by survival sequencing. So the integrity of genomic DNA is important, but as long as the fragments are longer than 2,000 base pairs, you should be fine. Uh, and then there's some limitations as to which buffers the DNA has to be in, but all of this can usually be solved uh, by changing the buffer or by cleanups. Um, and also I wanted to say, yeah, the input amount you need, if your material is perfect, uh, probably you can get away with 10 nanograms. Usually we recommend 100 nanograms. And um, in extreme cases where your DNA might be degraded, maybe FFPs, you might want to increase it to 200 nanograms, but, but that's, that's all. Okay, good. Moving on to our next question. If one has multiple rat, rats per treatment group, to save cost, would you recommend pooling samples within the treatment group for RRBS analyses? Okay, so it, it depends on the size of your sample set, uh, but what I would never do, for instance, is to have a pool that is untreated and the other pool would be treated. So this should be always mixed in a random fashion. And this is also how we set up the protocol, because the way we pool samples is random. It's just based on the performance of the sample during the library preparation. So, uh, usually we end up with random mixtures of the treatment groups, but you're, yes, it's important if you pool samples, not to have one pool with one condition and the other pool with the other condition. Otherwise, yeah, maybe the conversion efficiency is a bit higher for one pool than for the other. But generally the method should be robust enough, but it's just not, not a good style to design an experiment, I would say. Okay, moving on to our next question. What kind of tissues did you use to compare methylation patterns between differentiated species? Okay, I, I'm not, not sure if I get this right, but I, I think the question refers to the, the different species I showed in the end, right? And there it was really a variety of tissues. We had brain, uh, liver, I think we had heart, muscle, so um, lots of different tissues that we extracted for this uh, experiment. Actually, Johanna extracted them. Okay. 
another attendee asks, why would this only work for vertebrates? Do you know if it could be adjusted to work with non-model invertebrate species? Okay, so um, the limitation of doing this in vertebrate samples relates to the phenomenon of CPG islands, which um, to my knowledge uh, occurs mostly in vertebrates. And RBS is based right, on, on this idea that there are certain regions which have lots, lots of CPGs. Um, so this is why we recommend to do it on vertebrates. Um, it, we would have to simulate this actually on the computer, how it would work in, in a different um, non-vertebrate organism. It can be done, uh, for instance, if you uh, know how to use R, there's a good package uh, called BS Genome. You can create your own genomes there and you can simulate the digestion on the computer and look at what the protocol would do. So the good thing about RBS is you can always simulate what it would do on the computer before you start doing it. Uh, because it's, it's really the cutting efficiency is almost 100% and you get the fragments that you are simulating basically. Okay then, our next question. How do you know if it's a methylated cytosine or just a CT mutation? Um, this is something that you cannot really know, um, but that usually doesn't matter that much because you're comparing samples and you're only interested in differences between samples usually. So in our projects, uh, we are interested in differential methylation. So meaning in one sample, it would be mostly T's. In the other sample, it would be mostly C's. And then of course we know this is not a, a somatic mutation probably, but it is uh, differential methylation. The only way really to find out would be to do also a normal library. So an unconverted library and sequence it along. And then you would, you would find those um, those mutations as well, and you can compare. So if, if this is interesting, I'd recommend to have an unconverted library sequence along. Okay then, it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, do you consider using R scripting or R programming for bisulfate sequencing data analysis? Yeah, I think actually, so I, when I joined the Bock Lab, I was actually mostly a wet lab uh, person. Um, so I developed this RBS protocol and it also got me interested in doing some parts of the analysis. And I think one of the best things I did in this regard was to start using R, uh, even though it might not be maybe the, in terms of, I think computational people would say that Python is probably more elegant and easier, the syntax is easier. But uh, R just provides you with access to all those biological databases and there's so many interesting packages um, for also methylation analysis. Um, I think it, it's a really good platform to do the analysis. Great. Well, we do want to once again thank Paul Datlinger for bringing us this presentation today. And of course, thank our sponsor, Diagenote, for making the webcast possible. Before we wrap up, Paul, do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience? So I would just like to thank everyone for your attention. You can see it's already getting a bit dark behind me. This is because it's uh, evening here in Vienna. So I conclude this and I wish you a good evening from Vienna and, and have a nice day. Thanks for listening. Thank you, of course, to Paul. We hope you have a good evening. Thank you again to Diagenote for making today's webcast possible. I want to let our attendees know that this broadcast is going to be avail available for on-demand replay. You'll be receiving an email from LabRoots alerting you when it's available, and we would invite you to forward that email to any of your colleagues who might have missed Paul's live presentation today. That's all we have for now. We hope we see you again. Goodbye.